if for any reason, um, like any personal information comes up that you would like us to scrub from the recording, um, please don't hesitate to reach out. I'll include my email um, in the chat a little later um, so that we can make sure that like any personal information that like anyone shares um, is kept confidential. Um, I also want to take a moment to thank you all for being here with us. Um, I know that it's pretty late for a lot of people um, and we are just like, happy to be able to offer this resource to all of you. Um, my name is Maria Alejandra Silva. I'm a program coordinator at the IWMF. Um, and I work with uh, Jeff, who is here. He's our director of security um, and journalists like Corinne to offer these kinds of trainings um, to people in the journalism community. Um, before I let them introduce themselves, I just wanted to mention that um, we um, would love for you to participate uh, by sending questions in the chat um, or asking questions in the Q&A. Um, I know that we have a lot of experienced journalists here tonight, so I'd like to invite you all to share any additional tips or advice as it comes up, um, because I'm sure that there's a lot of knowledge that we could share with each other. Um, so Jeff, would you like to go ahead and introduce yourself? Yeah, thank you very much, Al. Um, I'm actually the uh, security director of IWMF. I've been uh, working um, uh, six years as the security director. And before that, I was a security advisor uh, for journalists and media outlets, right? Uh, pretty much everywhere, worldwide, um, Africa, Latin America, and the Middle East. And then, yeah, and uh, since March, I'm like doing webinar instead of um, physical training, yeah? And then it's a, it's a pleasure to be with you guys. Thanks, Jeff. Uh, Corinne, would you like to take it away? Yeah, thanks everyone for having me. My name is Corinne Chin. I'm a senior video journalist at the Seattle Times, where I also lead the Newsroom's Diversity and Inclusion Task Force. And as a staff journalist with the Seattle Times, I had the privilege of participating in an IWMF fellowship in 2019 um, on the US-Mexico border. And before that reporting trip, we received hostile environment and first aid training. Um, Jeff was one of our trainers. So um, I, I have had that experience and I've also been reporting here locally in Western Washington throughout this summer of protests. I've also reported abroad on protests. Um, I was at the World Cup protests in Brazil in 2014 and um, other protests um, at previous jobs in Johannesburg and in Nairobi. So um, I have, those are kind of the perspectives I bring and I'm here today, particularly as a journalist of color. Um, I know this is a training that we specifically marketed to journalists of color. So really what I'm here as is not a security expert by any means, but as a working journalist, just like you who has to can have these considerations as we as we navigate. So my portion of the presentation, I'll really focus on what was going through my head at, uh, during certain scenarios, share some anecdotes, and really just get you thinking about what it might be like to be in the field, you know, this upcoming few weeks or in the future. Um, and then Jeff will really get into the specifics of security tips and tricks. So that'll be the dynamic. We'll both be here in the chat throughout the whole thing, answering your questions. And of course, feel free to contact me on the JOC Slack after the presentation if you have further questions. Um, I'm just at Corinne on the JOC Slack. So, hi. Corinne, thank you so much. And I'm really glad that you brought that point up because I wanted to talk also a little bit about why we decided to do this webinar in the first place. Um, like we all know that like journalists who are people of color face enhanced risks, especially in the context of white nationalist violence. Um, and we wanted to offer a space um, to talk about like strategies to um, stay safe. Um, and as we all know, like the journalism safety world tends to be very like white man dominated. Um, and a lot of the times the safety advice that they give is very tailored to that worldview. Um, and a lot of the times considerations for women or for women of color or for people of color just aren't necessarily talked about. Um, so we want to open a space where we can talk about those things too. Um, we'll start the presentation um, with uh, Corinne's uh, slides and her experiences. Um, and then we have a presentation from Jeff on um, like some practical advice on uh, how to prepare and, and what to do in these situations. Um, and then we will have time 
at the end for questions. But like I mentioned earlier, if any questions come up during the presentations, please feel free to let us know um, and uh, we'll, we'll try to address them. Um, so Karin, if you'd like to take it away. Thank you. I'm going to share my screen. Always the moment of greatest anxiety for these things. Okay, can everyone see my presentation? Yes, you're perfect. Thank you. Oh, for Zoom. Here we go. Okay, so um, like I said, you know, I, I, I am not um, an expert, but I these are just things I've learned. There are going to be things that I miss. And luckily, I think there are so many um, great resources that are coming out in light of what's been happening in our country. So I will highlight a few of those throughout my presentation. But I wanted to say before you go, um, I'm not going to talk too much about this. I just wanted to draw your attention to it, especially for journalists of color. Make sure your digital security hygiene is in good shape because we have heard about doxing and online harassment or people finding information about you online and they, they can then use that to follow you or stalk you or engage in physical harassment or threats. So I just wanted to make sure to mention this because I think it's really important. Um, and it's something that I did um, this spring to really lock down um, my digital security. And IDOMAF actually has this great online course um, there are a few online courses on digital security, but you can Google or screenshot this and look it up later. Um, this is definitely something I recommend before you even decide whether you're going to cover the events of this coming week or not. Um, so first, um, I wanted to start with like what to wear and, and what to pack, because this is the question I get the most. And I'm actually going to stop my screen share now because I'm going to I'm going to go through what I what I bring when I'm covering a protest. And so the first thing of course is my camera bag. Um, and I try to keep it really compact so that I'm still mobile. And so this is a fanny pack and I, I wear it, you know, either on my front or on the side. Um, so just wanted to say this first because this is kind of a big component of the weight that I'm carrying. Um, this and you know my camera would be outside of it. And then the thing I think you think a lot of you are very interested in, um, well, so maybe I'll just wear this, that'll be fun, right? Um, to show you what all is on me as I'm navigating these situations. So this is my, this is my body armor. This is a size three extra small. Um, and I wanted to mention that because I think a lot of women might forget like who this body armor is made for. And Jeff's going to go into recommendations, I think, in his presentation. Um, and this is hard to get at this point, but, um, you know, we'll, we'll talk about considerations and what to wear and like if it's too heavy for you or all of that later on. Um, but I'm just going to kind of build my kit for you guys. So I'm going to a situation. I've got this on, I've got my fanny pack on, and on my back, this is my backpack of safety gear. And um, this is everything I use. So in this bottom compartment here, this very easy access bottom compartment, Jeff will go into all this equipment. I'm just gonna show you what I have. Um, I have goggles to protect from rubber bullets. And I have my half mass gas respirator to protect from tear gas and pepper spray. So this I keep in my bottom compartment if it's really light, if things are getting more tense, I will, you know, I'll start wearing it. I'll, I'll have it on me. Um, I also have, um, sometimes we have ballistic helmets and staff, but I, I own a climbing helmet. So I have that in my bag for impact, rocks, rubber bullets. Um, I also have a bump cap, which is just something to consider. It's a hard hat. It can protect against some stuff. It's really not that protective. At most, it'll protect you if someone punches you in the head. It's not that protective, so don't depend on that. Um, I have these shooting earmuffs to protect against the sound cannons that some police are using to disperse crowds. I have a microfiber cloth in case of you know, spills or rain for my gear. I have an umbrella. 
a bag of snacks and electrolytes because you don't want to be passing out at one of these situations. Um, and I have extra PPE, um, sanitizer, things like that. Extra masks. Um, I have a tourniquet because this is the most important, I think the most urgent first aid threat is bleeding out. Um, I actually also have uh, stuff for collapsed lungs. I have a high visibility vest in case I really want to be seen and extra just COVID supplies. Um, and I actually also, also water, water bottle, um, caffeine. Um, and I don't know where I put it. So this is a good exercise, but I also have wipes for, for tear gas and pepper spray. Um, and another thing I wanted to draw attention to is what I'm wearing. So um, I'm wearing cotton from head to toe. Nylon is flammable, so that's not something you should wear. So, so check the actual tags on your clothing to make sure. Um, so now that I'm kind of in my outfit, um, I'll just take you through the situations that I've, I've been in this year and um, walk, walk you through some of those. Uh, let me just double check that. Okay, what to wear and what to pack. We've gone through that. Um, so situations of civil unrest. There's a lot that your news organization and your team should be doing to keep you safe. But I, I realize that not all of you are on teams or have those resources. So I'm gonna really literally concentrate on what the individual can do. Sorry, I'm not gonna wear that. Um, <laughs> so the best place to be in a protest if you wanna stay safe is to be up above the action and out of the way. And so this is a picture that my colleague, Erica Schultz, a fellow IWMF fellow took of me in um, June, I believe. And um, right in this moment, I'm actually filming <laughs> this situation where a car drove into the crowd of protesters and the driver got out and shot someone. Um, and this is a situation where there's a huge crowd of protesters in the police line facing off. So it was really, um, a very tense situation. And I'm really, really glad that I was up in the building um, because I wasn't in the crowd. I wasn't getting hit by the car. You know, the shooter, although he could have shot up at the building was, was not focused on the building and was really focused on the crowd. So this is the best case scenario and the safest place to be in a situation like this. Um, but sometimes we find ourselves in a more dangerous position. And I did many times. And even if you know what the correct thing to do is, you know what the smart thing to do is, you might end up in a situation like this one. Um, this is May 30th, which was the first really big um, police response to the crowds in Seattle this summer. Um, and so I'm right behind that first plume of tear gas that gets deployed. And after this, a whole lot of other tear gas gets deployed. This is a video by Mike Baker, one of my former colleagues who now works at the New York Times. And you can see how many police there are. Um, as soon as I got out of the car on May 30th, I, it was just so many people that the line of police with their bicycles immediately pinned myself and my reporting partner against a crowd um, in front of the Nordstrom in downtown Seattle. And um, that is the worst place to be. Like I remember, I, I just said above is the best place to be. That's probably the worst place to be because we couldn't move. We were stuck between the crowd and the police, which you are in between two antagonistic forces. Like you don't want to be in that situation. But that's the situation that we found ourselves in. And unfortunately, I was, that's where I was. So um, just to warn you all, there might be some triggering um, flashbang, grenades, tear gas, and all of that imagery in the slides to come. So since my partner, um, Amanda Snyder, a photojournalist, and I were pinned for about 45 minutes, we had some indicators that stuff was going down. Like you see here, the police started putting on their gas masks. Um, you know, if, if, every officer is putting on their gas mask, you know something's about to go down. So be on high alert. Um, we saw some police grabbing their pepper spray canisters. We saw um, SWAT officers wearing different uniforms come out onto the scene with the large guns that they used to fire tear gas and rubber bullets. 
And for visual journalists, I actually used my shotgun microphone on my camera and I had my headphones on because it was so loud in the crowd, but I could actually hear better what the police were saying and planning to do when I had my headphones on and I had the mic pointed at them. So that's, that's kind of an unexpected tip. Um, so we were not prepared, I would say, for this level of stuff, but I, I'm, I'm just gonna um, show you my raw footage. It's really bad um, because of the situation we were in and I'm just gonna kind of talk, to, talk you through it while it's playing. So what just happened there, you probably didn't catch it really quickly. But... So um, my partner Amanda was wearing a backpack and in the stampede, um, as people were sprinting away from that first plume of tear gas that you all saw, somebody grabbed her backpack and was almost dragging her down. And I saw that and actually pulled them off. Right there. That's the first flashbang grenade. And at that point, I'm thinking, there's Amanda. At that point, I'm thinking they're really escalating this crowd to right now. So you'll see Amanda reappear in my footage because I'm not really focusing too much on filming right now. I'm more focusing on where's Amanda, are we in the correct position? So here we are backing up, we're getting away from where that person was the most So here we are backing up slowly. Here's Amanda. I always know where she is at all times. So right now what I'm thinking is what direction is the wind flowing? Where is the tear gas going to go? So I'm getting out of the gas and right now. And I'm thinking, okay, they just did a couple. Maybe, maybe we can go in a little bit. Let's go back. There's Amanda. We're going back to where it was. It seems like we can go over. We're photographing a little bit. You can hear Amanda shudder, right? Because I'm right next to her all this entire time. Now keep an eye on okay, so, got my eye on Amanda. I'm not filming right now, I'm just moving with her. More tear gas is coming. Let's sit, let's just stay right here and evaluate a little bit. We're so kind of moving in and out of the action and always being aware of what is our speed of. Okay, it's getting closer. So you kind of see at this point Amanda's getting closer than I would have liked to, but it seems like I'm staying up with her to be with her. So at this point, take a look at this police car. They just broke that back window of the police car and they're stealing guns out of it. And they're about to set that police car on fire. And you can see the tear gas is getting really quick. So that's kind of the point where I was like, you know what, I think this it's time. We gotta call it, we gotta get out. They've just stolen a gun out of this police car. They're throwing accelerant on it um, to start setting on fire. Ultimately they did set six cars on fire that day. And so with the tear gas getting that thick, you could see it was almost a whiteout in my footage. We eventually found um, this alley where, you know, this is the point where I'm like, okay, you've gotta go and be especially go down the alleyway and that is how we get out of this huge crowd of people are 
during COVID, people are coughing and crying and throwing up. And instead of just trying to run down that piece of the gas and catch it with us, we take a turn from the pattern. And that's, that's the best way. Um, so that I just wanted to give you all a sense of kind of what it's like in the moment when things are really tense, what was going through my head at that time, and most of those things I had gotten from the heat back training that I did with the IWMF. Um, one, one note is it's really important for when you are, you know, I think it's really important to pair up if possible. Um, one person is, is, is filming and working, but the other person at that time is, is your eyes and ears and is what people will say as a back watcher, you're, you're just watching their back. So this is um, my colleague, Erica Schultz um, at a later protest. And so she's paired up with Ramon Dampour. He snapped this picture, but other than snapping this picture of her, he was not, he was not filming. Erica was photographing that day and he was watching her back at that time. Um, and that's Ramon who took that photograph. And here we are leaving a protest. Um, I think it's really important to always work in at least pairs and group up if you can even if that means looking out for a journalist at a competing organization, you know, your safety is more important and your life is more important than any story or any photograph or any quote you can get. So always, always remember that. And, um, you know, we're, we're leaving this protest. So I'm still wearing my goggles, you can see, right? Because I don't wanna get hit by a rubber bullet even if we're just walking back to the car. Um, and then this, I'll just quickly show you. This is um, this is actually footage from my heat fat training in Mexico, and this is how you navigate a crowd. So you can grab each other by the hand if you if if there's a big crowd and you're about to be separated, which which happened to me and Amanda when we were pinned up against Nordstrom. You can grab each other's hand, right? But it's really easy to pull people apart by the hand. So all this video shows is try to grab people by the clothing instead. Um, it's, it's harder, you know, you have a better grip on someone's top. And um, instead of just pushing forward and walking straight forward, if you do that pivoting, rotating movement, it's easier to navigate a crowd. So I just wanted to share that little clip. Um, and then finally, you know, I know I, I've gone really fast and this is by no means comprehensive, but CPJ just put out this um, really, really good um, tip sheet read through the whole thing, especially if you're going out soon. Um, they're really, it's really, really good advice. Um, and I'll just quickly go over my experiences with the far right as a journalist of color. Um, like I said, digital security is really, really paramount. Um, but I wanted to share an experience in May. I was reporting, not, it had nothing to do with protests, but I was just reporting out. It was locked down. There was really no one outside. I was interviewing um, two women of color out on the sidewalk. And it's locked down, right? No businesses are open. I'm just interviewing them in front of their shuttered business. And this man comes up and just starts filming us. And I say, excuse me, sir, can I help you? And it becomes really clear that this man is just here to harass and provoke us. I think he saw three small women of color alone on the street and saw a target. And so he started asking really aggressive questions and um, really threatening our safety. But because I had gone through this HEFAT, I did not do what my original instinct would be, which would be to just all three of us go back to our car and leave. Um, because one, I didn't know who he was, what he wanted. Two, I didn't know how many of him there were. There could be someone right around the corner. Um, Three, I didn't want him to see any of our cars and be able to follow and track us. So I wanted to share a little bit of, of what I did. So it turned out, I'll just skip to a little bit. It turned out that he was a member of a far right group and this was a tactic they were using to harass journalists, which was to film them and try to egg them on into either calling the police or saying something um, that they could then post to their followers on their networks that they could say, look at the biased media. These are all liberal, um, untrustworthy people. So they have been targeting journalists um, by, by filming and harassing them. So I, I didn't know this before that. Um, that was only after I did my research, but um, what I did know was that I, I, I didn't want him to follow me. So these are just some tips if you're being followed. Um, you know, this could happen 
just like I was just reporting a normal story. This could happen after covering a demonstration or civil unrest. Um, so how to determine if you're being followed is, this is a, a technique Jeff taught and he can go more into later, but it's, it's called TED and it's called time, environment, distance and demeanor. So time, if you see the same person kind of pop up throughout the day repeatedly over time, that could be an indication that you're being followed. Environment, if you are at one place and then you're at another and you see them in both places that doesn't seem connected, like maybe you're, you're at the grocery store and then you see them again at the, at the coffee shop, which is not next to the grocery store, that could be an indication. So check your environment. Distance, if you usually take one route to work every day um, and then you decide to take another one another day and that, guy, and that guy's still there, you might be being followed. Um, and demeanor, you know, if someone's acting weird or suspicious, um, you know, and this is, you know, obviously what I was really concerned about with this particular um, guy was he, he was acting in a way that was not typical of a normal person. Um, if you see, you know, just follow your instincts. So, so the techniques that I used for my training in this situation, um, I didn't want him to see our cars, first of all. So I, I, I in the situation, I said, you know, um, I engaged with him and then I, I indicated to one of the women I was interviewing, hey, lock up leave while I was still engaged with him and she was able to leave and I can make sure she left safely while he was distracted by me. Okay, good. But when I eventually got into my car, um, I turned left three times and um, made sure that the same car was not behind me because if you turn left three times, you just made a U-turn. And um, if, if the same car follows you all that way, maybe they're, maybe they're following you. Maybe they're not going to where they need to go, right? Um, Jeff told me to drive in the middle lane if there's multiple lanes because you can merge left or right instead of being cornered one way or the other. Um, and if this happens to you while you're walking, walk against the direction of traffic, you know, because people can come drive up behind you and you might not see them. So face the car is coming in your direction so you can see what's coming at you. If you are pretty sure you're being followed, you can cut through a store, you can cut through a business, um, you know, so you're less out in the open. Um, that wasn't available to me with COVID, unfortunately, which was why, you know, we waited it out and um, I did this thing in my car, but um, also going to a safe crowded area, which might be more accessible these days um, back th than back in the spring, getting on a bus or a train or some other public transportation, just being around people who can help you if you might need it. Um, and also sending your WhatsApp location to a friend. Um, if you use WhatsApp and you know how to do that, it's pretty quick and simple. Um, another thing that we did during protests at the Seattle Times is we use an app called Life360, or you can use WhatsApp. We've used that before. There's a number of different apps you can use to actually share your location with your editor or with your reporting partner if you get separated or if you just wanna know where each other is. Um, and then the last thing I'll share about kind of you know, I'm not all that familiar with, with like QAnon or Proud Boys or these groups. I don't know a lot about them or, or what, what they use. So I would say just educate yourself on that because if you can be aware of that, then you know what you need to be avoiding out in the field. So I, I really like this CNN piece that just came out about some of the symbols. Um, I learned about some that I hadn't known about before. Um, ADL has this hate, hate symbol database, hate group database, so they have a lot of information there. Um, and if you are reporting on any stories like this, I highly, highly recommend just familiarizing yourself with this stuff. And that's all I have for my presentation. I know I went fast. I know I just like barely touch the surface on stuff. Jeff's going to go in more detail and I'm going to be here for the rest of the um, hour and a half to answer questions in the chat and at the end. So thank you. And thank you so much. Um, it's always super helpful to hear your perspective because obviously we can give all the safety advice in the world, but um, hearing you talk about the practical application of it is I think incredibly helpful for everyone. Um, so I'm gonna hand it off to Jeff, who's gonna start uh, his part of the presentation. Um, and I guess we'll just give him a moment to start his uh, slides. Awesome. 
Excellent. So you can see the, the screen right now. Awesome. Um, good. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Corinne. That was really, really uh, useful. Um, good. What we're gonna do right now? I'm gonna. Try, I'm, I only have like 45, 15 minutes to, to actually speak about a lot of topic. Uh, we're gonna start with basically what to bring, right? What to wear, uh, basically. Your like what to do reference of your uh, identity, right? Planning and preparation, how to move in a crowd, right? Um, so I'm going to speak about the far right groups, you know, um, not basically all the groups there is, but basically what to do, uh, what's going to be the best advice, right? The guidance uh, when you're going to cover this kind of uh, protest, okay, the violent crowd. Police tactics, what kind of weapon they're using, right? And then a more like uh, active shooter, okay? Uh, the far right groups is gonna be more basically the worst case scenario. I mean, which is uh, they're gonna decide to attack, um, right? It could be another capital, another state, it could be uh, anywhere in, in the US, right? According to FBI, it is really, really a concern. There is a huge, um, uh, chance that they're gonna do something and then um, it probably is gonna be extremely violent. Um, and then they're not speaking only on, about violent crowd, they're speaking about insurrection. And then basically um, I'm gonna show you what could happen, right? What could, could be the trend, right? In the new normal, right? It is, um, it is um, really concerning. Uh, I'm not in our little miss but I'm really worried about what could happen in the next days, weeks, or months, okay? Um, in terms of, um, in term of a PP, I will do uh, at the end, I'm gonna stay you know, after the session. And if you guys have any question regarding PP and I can just continue basically what kind of uh, respirator you should have, how, where to get it, half mask respirator, full mask, uh, gas mask, what kind of glasses can give you recommendation right, to get some really cheap uh, and ballistic glasses. Plus, um, you know, what kind of helmets, okay? And I can actually speak with you all with, uh, on that at the end of the, uh, on the, uh, basically, the session. Um, in terms of extra protection, fly jacket, body armor, right? There's two kind of uh, body armor. The, the one, which is uh, 3A, the, the soft body armor, which is gonna protect you only against pistol and revolvers, and then low caliber bullets, okay? Uh, and then basically a, the body armor with cer cer ceramic plates, which is gonna protect you against large caliber bullets, right? AR-15, the assault weapon that we see, especially um, in these protests, right? When they actually carry the long rifle, the assault weapon, okay? And then we're gonna speak as well, Kevlar helmet, basically. I do in protests and stuff, I don't, like I'm not a big fan of the big, big helmets, the, the, the Kevlar helmet. It can only protect shramlos from bombing or from uh, um, basically small caliber bullets, such as pistol and revolvers. And it's really heavy. It's uh, between four and five pounds and it's extremely uh, heavy actually. So I am um, more um, basically for a more like a, like um, uh, Corinne was saying, right? Sort of like bike slash, uh, you know, bike or BMX uh, climbing, uh, basically um, uh, helmet, which is going to protect you against uh, the projectile from the police, the less little projectiles, any rock, any stuff that you can, you may be hit, right? If someone tried to hit you with, uh, let's say, a baseball bat, right? That's going to actually protect you, right? On a certain extent, okay, which is a Kevlar helmet. It's really mil military, and then th that's going to slow you down. Uh, and I'm going to speak more uh, later on, okay. Um, what you, should you wear in a far right protest, okay? But you do not want to look like that, okay? Um, you know, because you, you you know you don't want to wear all black, right? All black clothing because they may thinking you're antifa. You know, I think you guys saw uh, the footage, right, of um, of the journalist, right, who got got beaten. You know, was a victim and got attacked, right, by a far right, um, ex, you know, activist. And it basically, is um, right. Um, I'm not saying because he was wearing all black, but it may be one of the reasons why they decide to attack him. 
okay? So I uh, try to avoid wearing all black, okay? To not look like, let's say, someone from Antigua. Um, so I would to wear, basically, wearing a belt, um, it's really good uh, because, um, you know, in, if in terms of like, if they're, if the, if it get really violent, right, and they try to pull your pants or anything like that, but at least the belt will hold everything together. Plus, um, you know, if you want to put uh, your press ID right on your belt, right, or any lanyard on your belt, you know, with the press ID basically in your pocket, it's better than if you have it on your neck. Because if you have, if you have your press ID on your neck, any actually lanyard, they can actually pull it and then drag it to the floor, right, which is uh, on your belt, it's better. And then, uh, yeah, it's a better option. Uh, basically, wear uh, rain shoes. Anything is going to actually protect your ankle, right? You don't want to, like, you know, be injured. So every shoe that you're going to be able to run and protect your ankle. Um, so I was saying avoiding wearing all black. Um, basically, avoiding wearing a long, like, ponytail. I mean, you know, you try to fix your hair because if you don't want to basically give them anything that they can pull you, right? So if you have your hair, you know, um, like on your back, it's it may be a problem because they're gonna. It's gonna be really easy for anyone to basically, you know, drag you on the floor. Um, basically, avoiding uh, any like nylon polyesters in acrylic, right? Because the problem is, um, like all like if it's cotton or anything like that, if it, you know it's cotton, if it actually burn, right, it's gonna just get burned, right? But nylon polyesters in acrylic, as soon as they burn, they melt. And they're going to cause externally severe burns. Why I'm telling you that? Because what we've been observing from uh, last Wednesday is they you, they may use a cocktail Molotov, Mol Molotov cocktail, you know, which is I'm going to speak to you in a bit what it is, okay, and what what's, what would be the danger of it. Um, adding a um, one strap uh, bag, back, backpack, side bag, or a messenger bag, it's better than a two strap backpack. Like uh, Corin was saying, it just because it's just too easy for anyone to drag you over, right? Which is when you can have a bag, you can put on 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 the front, on the side. It's 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 better for security. Uh, press ID on your waist. So I was saying you can tie around your belt, uh, loop if possible, and then basically minimize your profile putting in your actually pocket. Okay. Um, good. Well, as you already know, your identity, right, as a person of color, journalist can actually increase your profile. And then you're all aware of that and it make you a target, in a, especially, especially in a far right crowd or from the police, you may be a target. The main goal is to find a strategy that will help you mitigate that, that basically that, that risk. Hey, basically paying uh, special attention to your posi positioning, right, your position, right, where you're gonna go where you're gonna be and basically your distance from the crowd, okay? And then the main point is maintaining situational awareness and working with a partner, which is, can be an ally, right? To, who could actually help to help reducing your risk. Um, and then basically the key is movement, always moving, moving, and then be aware, distance, and all the, all the times try to uh, find the best position. And uh, Jeff, I just wanna add, I. I've heard this from a couple of journalists is that um, they recommend like working with a partner that um, can like use their privilege to shield you if shit hits the fan, excuse my language. But um, like if you're a woman working with like um, a partner who is a man or if you are a person of color working with a partner who is white um, so that if something happens, um, they can be an active bystander um, on your behalf. Yeah, sure. Uh, yeah. Sorry, I had a problem with my clicker. Good. In terms of, uh, of, of planning, right, there is a, a couple of stuff that you could do, uh, you should do actually, to be able to mitigate uh, the risk, okay, to going to a violent crowd, far right uh, protest, right? And then basically, it's really easy. You, you, sh you have to do a couple of things before to actually going there. It's only actually taking a few minutes, okay? Basically, like I just put on, on the left, a possible protest spots, such as like, let's say Capitol Hill. That was like more like a DC, but can be everywhere, basically, if you're thinking, 
right? That um, there's going to have some sort of violent crowd or some sort of civil unrest. It's basically from your state, from your city, you're more likely to know where it's going to be the spot, right? The, the sensitive spot. And basically to try what you want to do is before to actually getting there in every location, right? Which is sensible. You need to, and I'm going to explain to you right after on the next slide, you need to have what we call a reunion or administrative point, meeting point, right? That a place that you're going to go all the times if you're working with someone, okay? To always having one spot that and let's say if you like if you get lost or you know or you can all we can split you're always going to go there maybe you want to change battery or, or anything like that maybe it's just not safe at the moment and you want always to go to that uh, at that meeting point and i will actually in next slide showing you um uh, better okay uh, another it's one one or two security points right it's basically when you go when the admin point is compromised let's say if the police line like basically, or actually in your in a point and there's no way you can go there, you need to have these kind of like alternate uh, rendezvous points, right? If the uh, the meeting point is compromised. Um, like um, Karen was saying, indoor vantage point, that's one of the best thing you can do. Always be basically um, in the like higher, like, uh, like you want to have uh, basically a vantage point to be like, I think she was on the second story, right, of the building. So why you can scout before to look maybe for coffee, maybe for a restaurant, right, to basically be able to have an vantage point, right? Higher you are, better it is. And as well for, as well for gas, for the gas. As soon as they have all done, actually, this, uh, this tear gas, I'm going to tell you later on, but basically higher you are, and less gas you're gonna have because basically gas it's on the first three meters okay because the gas is actually heavier than air okay possible well, possible bathrooms right because it's useful and then you need to go to the bathroom and then sometimes it's not the, the time to actually look for one when you're like you know you need to go and then you know and, and always good to scan before um as well and what you need as well it's a safe heaven Okay, let's say if you're covering a protest and then it starts shooting, you don't want to go to your maybe main point. You really want to be back on safety and going to a place that basically your life depends on it, on it and then it starts shooting, you want to be at a place that actually um, it's going to be away from everything there. And then usually it's an indoor place, right, that they're basically, if there's any active shooter situation, near a crowd or any shooting, you want to go there, okay? Um, and then basically you should have two evacuation routes, okay, I'm gonna just say like this, okay? You should, basically, that's an example, right? Basically uh, in Seattle, actually. And then basically, uh, let's say most um, most of the, like basically the, the action were here, right? In front of the Seattle or over here. Basically what you want, you want an admin point that it's actually not too far that you can go there like basically in 15 seconds. And I just put, I basically on the corner over here of the building. So I'm basically, if I'm working with Corinne, yeah, it's good. okay, Corinne, um, you're gonna do your stuff, right? I have to do my interview or anything like that. So I right, let's meet up there, word me what's up or anything like that. Okay. Um, if there's a lot of person, like a couple of thousand, what's going to happen is you're going to see that you're going to have a saturation, right, um, of the uh, of the network. So I, if I'm trying to what's up, Corinne, it's not going to work, right? Maybe I'm going to try to call her, it's not going to work because the basically at work there's too many persons sending stuff, and basically you won't be able to to communicate with uh, with your partner with, of the person you're you're working with okay it's basically what a, a good tips that you could do it's basically putting a, a an alarm okay let's say i'm going to put an alarm every 30 minutes or every it's why kareem we're going to put our alarm every 30 minutes we're gonna you know if we're not able to communicate right we're going to actually uh, meet uh, meeting each other on the on the admin point okay so every 30 minutes my phone will ring why putting an alarm and not just looking at your phone? It's just because when you're in it, like basically, especially when it's like chaotic and then basically, but like five minutes, right? 
sorry, an hour looked like five minutes, okay? You know, it's why basically you won't see your phone if you put an alarm, but at least, okay, 30 minutes, 30 minutes, 30 minutes, but that can be a sign, especially if you're not able to communicate with that person to basically uh, meeting the person right there. So it's, I, I didn't have any news, we, we get split up, it rang again, but I can just get to that point, okay? Um, and, and then basically the security points that I put here, right? That when I actually um, went there or before, I said, okay, there is a, a, a fire station over here, right? It's a um, like more neutral place, not like a police station, but like fire fire station in Otapo over right here. And I, I pushed it on the extremity. And basically it's, let's say it's start shooting or anything like that, but I know I can just uh, go with Corinne and running there and then maybe shelter over here. Right. And then basically the security points, it's either if it's, let's say, shooting or or is because that point is compromised. Let's say the police over here, uh, they, they just decide to charge us and then we but our point is compromised, but we still have this point. OK. And then this point, it's, you know, you can just WhatsApp send a text saying, OK, we're going to meet them, you know, to exchange battery or something. OK. And it's always a, it's always a good thing to have. Uh, in terms of evacuation routes, right, let's say the same thing over here. You can, let's say, if uh, you want to put your admin point over here, and then let's say you're going to park here, let's say, and then you're going to walk to the action. Let's say the, it's all a big, big crowd over here. You're going to get there. And then basically your admin point will be, in the, let's say, near the front end. Maybe the security point is going to be um, like in the parking lot. or And then you want basically a secret point. If you have one or two, you need to just, Basically, if you have a secret point in south, you want it in north, or if you want east, you know, in both direction. So I basically have my admin point here, my security point over here. Maybe I want a secret point, basically, um, in the other street over here, right? And then basically, my evacuation route, it's really simple, right? When I get in, that's going to be one evacuation route. But maybe if, if this one is compromised, maybe I want to go having a second evacuation route over here. Okay, so I basically, but you need to, if you're working with someone, you need to actually have a plan and speaking with that person. It may only take five minutes. Okay. Um, uh, basically, if you park your car, um, you know, um, and then it's always good to park your car in ready position, right? Because if it starts shooting, like it's getting violent and then you scare for your safety and you need to go it's not the time to basically try to uh, drive your car and then put it in reverse, in reverse, right? And then go, no, you need to get to the car and then basically going forward. You want to have the car in the ready position ready to basically leave, okay? Um, yeah, if you're going to drive, don't park your car uh, too, too near the action, like Karen was saying, if someone is following you and stuff, um, right? It's, it's, uh, sometimes it's better, it's better to, pay for parking, right? Because there was someone checking, you know, some sort of security. Um, before to go, you can actually send someone to to scan the area, but to be honest with Google map, it's really good if you're not feel familiar with the place. Um, and then, yeah, it, and then the, er, the earlier, it's actually the better, right? Try to arrive earlier, right? Because, you know, you're gonna be safer this way because you're gonna be able to, okay, that's our admin point. That's our safe, safety routes, right? It's where we're gonna park your car. And if you are earlier, you're gonna be able to really see, have a better, you know, vision than try to get there, like in the capital, right? Everything actually happened like this, right? They nobody had the time to to plan. Okay. Um, so I was saying, basically, having the alarm every thirty minutes on your phone to remind you to go back to the admin point, right? Otherwise, you can just say, okay, I'm, I'm still working, are you good, okay? Working as a team when shooting pictures, like Karen was saying, it's how always like a pair of systems, body systems. Uh, and then basically the most vulnerable is your back, right? You really need to protect your back. It's hard, even though if you're working, let's say I'm going with, I'm a, let's say I'm a photographer with uh, Karen. And basically, basically if I were back, I'm not saying like back to back like this, like, but we can be like two feet from each other, boom, boom, boom and then basically moving that we're back to back, okay? Um, and then, or, or at least body system, always have a look. If it's really getting violent and stuff, um, but you know, having someone in your back, it's really, really useful. 
Uh, like I was saying uh, earlier, right? Try to film from a high ground above the crowd if it's possible. It's why if you find a spot before, it's always a good thing. Stay away from anyone with a loudspeaker. They're the first one to basically, because it really depends, but the police, they're the first one to basically snatch, to, to detain. And then basically, usually, especially in a far right protest, the one with it, where the mic um, is not the most moderate person on earth, right? It's more likely to harass you, right? If you're near that person, stay away from this person, okay? Uh, you have to know your limits and when to get out, okay? I will always advise that when, when they're going to, any, any journalist going to the violent crowd is it's better to leave and coming back, leave and coming back. And so at the admin point, it's a good thing to coming back because after a while, right? Let's say in the, the crowd in the capital, you see like journalists, they're like in the middle and then basically they kind of lose the focus of everything. It's better to just going back and going in, going back, going in. Okay, so at the admin point, it's a good thing to just, okay, okay, this, 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 okay? But know your limits. Let's say if you have no PPE and it's getting violent and stuff, know your limits when to actually pull out, I'm out because it's, right now I'm too exposed, okay? In terms of risk assessment, right? Um, it, it, like, let's say uh, if you have like a risk, right? The risk is um, to, um, the risk is getting, beat it by someone in the crowd, right? But the thing is, if you're there, let's say 45 minutes taking pictures, it's not the same thing if you're there like three hours. I don't know if it makes sense, but like you're, you're extremely exposed, right? So you want to always lower your exposure, maybe changing position. Position, basically it's the key. Always moving around, changing. Be aware of your surrounding. You know, if you stay maybe 15 minutes, 15 minutes more, maybe it's, you know, you, you're gonna increase, you know, uh, you're gonna decrease your safety, right? You're gonna increase the risk that something happened. Okay, so I just always have uh, to think about, know your limits and then there is no problem to, to basically pulling, pulling back and going back. Uh, if individual are staring at you, right? Or verbally yelling at you, right? Basically just stop shooting, right? And get some distance from them. You know, you sum them from the corner of your eye it is really, it's really good, and I know it's hard, especially with PPE, to try to work with your perfect vision. If I saw someone, right, who's staring at me for like five minutes and start communicating with this buddy, just change position, leave, go out, just leave the place, and after just change, going to another place on the crowd, okay? Um, you know, and then, you know, if they're staring at you or they just, you know, just stop taking pictures like you were doing in it and then leaving, okay? All right, how to you guys move like in a violent crowd like this one, okay? Well, um, as soon as you're, let's say, between um, the, the protesters, right, and the first line of the police, or in that case, I would say a choke point, like a wall or something, but there is no coming back. You know, if you're like over here or something, try to leave like this, like to leave the crowd, it's extremely hard. So I always think if I'm gonna get in and really deep and deep and I'm not able to move, how am I gonna get out? And then basically if I start getting arrested, right, by one person, how am I gonna get out? What, where is the, my escape route? You know, there's no one. So I always think and consider basically is um, that, uh, you know, if I'm going to one place in a crowd, I'm gonna get it out, okay? Um, in terms of, um, of if you work with someone, uh, uh, Karina was saying like one technique, um, um, I really uh, uh, really like the, the technique to work with someone and basically is as a back watcher, but if you're going to really like dense crowd, you don't want to basically uh, be two person like getting in the crowd. No, you want to basically Corrine, if I'm working, let's say with Corrine, uh, basically usually uh, the larger person will go first and Corrine, she's like, she's like five foot three or something, right? She can, you know, she can go on my back. She can hold my, my back or my shirt and then I'm going to be like a train wagon and I'm going to get to the, 
in the crowd. This way it's better because she, and then she needs to hold my back or anything and be extremely close. That we're like one person. That's gonna, if someone pull you, it's gonna be way better because you're gonna be like one person. You're gonna have all the weight and you're gonna be better off than if you're like two person trying to get to a crowd. Okay, always like this. And then one is, is, is the train the person is following. Hey Jess, we have a, we actually have a question. Um, so to blend in with the crowd, is it better to take photos and videos with a cell phone? Or like if you have equipment, how do you blend into the crowd? Sure, uh, I'm gonna just uh, say the, um, like more like the uh, security part and maybe Karen can just uh, tell you how you did it. But basically is, it, it, it really depends, right? The thing is if it's like a really like a dense crowd, right? And then you're inside and stuff, like taking your phone, you're gonna definitely lower your, your exposure, right? Um, then if, if you're, you have your camera and you have space to take your pictures and stuff, because um, otherwise, you know, like they may see you like, you know, like they may spot you like as a journalist right away and then decide to just try to intimidate you, right? When it's a really, like, really dense uh, a crowd, and, which is when you can basically more like at the extremity over here and then filming and stuff, as soon as you're going there and then you start film, but you're extremely vulnerable. I don't know what you think, Karine. Yeah, I think, you know, it, it's a conversation to have with your team and your editor for sure. Um, and, and one thing I should have said is, is know what you want to get out of a situation before you go in. So if you're just covering breaking news, yeah, use a cell phone and it's easier to transmit and um, you know, if quality of, and cinematography is not the main thing, definitely use a cell phone. We used a cell phone a lot over the summer for those situations. Um, but, but the, you know, at some point we decided what we wanted to do was really tell the story of the movement and the protesters and really highlight those voices and not just cover the breaking news of the tear gas and the police response and the brutality that we witnessed. So, so we made really specific plans, like we're gonna use our professional camera equipment for this shoot, but because of that, we do need to bolster our security. We do need to have stricter protocols on who's watching the back and who's filming and where can we stand. So it's, it's always a cost benefit, but yeah, of course, having a cell phone helps you blend into the crowd better. Um, I will also add that, you know, live streaming has been something that's been really prominent, but keep in mind that if you're live streaming, people can find you. Um, so if you are concerned about being a target, you know, double, you know, think twice about live streaming or broadcasting. You know, I was really watching on, on Wednesday, I was watching a lot of correspondents broadcasting as they were being evacuated out of the Capitol. And I was like, oh my goodness, they can see where you are. And, you know, that's really dangerous. So I would say, it, it, you know, cell phone will help you blend in better unless you're live streaming, then they know exactly where you are. So be careful with that. Awesome, thank you, Karen. Um, yeah, I mean, look, when you're going to a crowd, like basically, let's say there's like 5,000 person or big, big crowd, you know, um, but basically the, there is um, a lot of, of folks or when they're going to a crowd, they're doing like the snake, right? They're going there and basically they're losing their sense, right, of our, our orientation, right? So are they getting, they're going here and get, they get in and get in and basically, especially if you need to, to actually tall, but basically you're gonna be starting of a lot of person and then basically you may facing someone in the middle of a crowd who really don't like you and then you're there and then you're like stuck, right? So I, what I, I like to uh, teach, I call it the flower method because at the end it's a really nice flower. But basically is like, it's an example. If you start here, right? Uh, let's say your admin point is over here. And then what you want to do, if you want the crowd to like, let's say take picture of the car, right? But basically what you want to do, you want to go in, right? You do what you have to do. And after when you're, you reach the level you want, you don't want to continue like a snake, right? You want to going back to the, to the path, right? And basically the goal is you want to going back, right? And then always be on the outskirts, right? And after, okay, I'm going in, let's I'm going over here and okay, I'm done. Okay, after I'm going here. And then basically at the end, it should to be, not at the end, but basically it should, um be like um um like a flower right and then the goal is not to do like the snake always going in going out by the same path you actually took okay um 
alt uh, right movement, right? Because of the outcome of the election and insurrection in the U.S. Capitol in D.C., waves of violence from the alt right or actually extremely likely to happen, right? It is uh, if it doesn't actually happen, I will be really surprised. So it's more likely that uh, a lot of stuff's gonna happen than you know the opposite. So I uh, the these alt right groups, you know, you have like. Someone from QAnon, like, you know, who's like, you know, is one individual, right? It's gonna go to a place, maybe be violent, right? Maybe bring a gun and start shooting on people. But there's really like, you know, groups, right? Different groups that they're extremely trained, like like three person, right? Um, there's, they're, they have been trained for years for that moment, okay? So if you see, uh, and then I think in the footage on the Capitol, we saw them really well. They're dressed, uh, they have a chest rig, which is, you know, they have body armor, helmets, uh, or not something they prefer actually, baseball cap. Um, you know, they have their gas mask on the side, right? They look tactical. They actually look like special forces, right? Uh, they have a headset or they have two-way radio, okay? Um, they have backpack. Okay, these individual they communicate with each other, or actually in a crowd, or extremely dangerous, right? Because they communicate with each other, they organize, they're they've been trained for years, right? And most likely they 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 carrying weapons, okay? And then basically, if you see this individual, you have to try to take a distance, okay, in a crowd because um, you know they're you know it, it's not like one bozo from QN and like you know. Um, going there and then try to something. No, they're organized and trained. Um, so I, you know, what the likelihood, what could actually happen, right? What, what we know, it's going to be uh, like coordinated attacks, right? Not only in DC, but everywhere in the US, right? They want to plan an attack, right? It's a, it's a terrorist attack, right? Uh, and then what they, they more likely to happen is they may using, um, you know, they're gonna have a target, right? We don't know if it's a march. We don't know if it's a political like infrastructures. We don't know that. There's, you know, there's no intel that we know, but they may just, you know, decide to go into a crowd and shoot, shoot people, right? Maybe using bombing, right? But one thing it's, it, it could happen, it's a shootout, okay? Shootout between the National Guards and these folks, right? With the police against these folks. So you may you 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 may uh, be in the middle of it, right? In the middle of, of the shooting. So I basically, um, if a confrontation happened, you have to look for hard cover, such a, a car. The only piece of what's actually going to protect in the car, it's the engine of a car, of a car, right? Not the trunk, not the door. It's only the engine. The rest of the car is useless if you want to take that hard cover. Okay. Any concrete protection, like you know, the big block over here, a, a thick tree, it could be a corner of a building, right? That will actually protect you against projectile. Okay. Um, one other thing is avoid being near someone with a gun at least five meters. I will show you why next slide. Okay, because otherwise you're gonna be in the corner, you're gonna meet in a cone of fire. You don't want there. Uh, get to a shop or a building, right? That's going to be hard cover there, right? If you're not shooting, try to uh, lower your, your body, right? You want to uh, be in prone position, right? Hitting the deck. But if you want to continue doing your, your stuff, because maybe it's going to shoot everywhere, they're going to have shooting everywhere. If during a shootout between an individual, you find yourself uh, be behind like a car or like a concrete uh, structures, uh, avoid, what you want to do is you don't want to you don't want, you want to avoid picking out from the top of the structures. What you want to do you want to actually be, when you take pictures you want to use a side because if you actually use the, the top right overhead over here you're extremely extremely exposed. You know if they, it's, they're shooting your direction you're more likely to get hit. I mean, I don't have much time to go in really in the details, but basically if you're going over like a structures, there is like 200 degrees, right? Of the direction they can show, shoot you, which is if you're going on the sides, right? Like of a car, when you take pictures or let's say concrete, 
you're way, way less exposed, right? Uh, there's only like, uh, so only like a percentage of basically degree, right? 360 degrees, who I can actually be able to hit you. It is really easy to get it. You're way more safe doing that than going overhead, always. Um, in terms of cone of fire, stay away from the person with a gun because it's really sinful. In the shooting, the person with the gun try to kill the person who's shooting him, right? So it's cone of fire. Everyone with a gun, if you're near the person five meter right or five meter left, you're gonna, like it's a 10 meters, you're gonna be in the cone of fire. If you're like shooting pictures from let's say a car and then you see a police officer shooting back or a national guard shooting back at an individual, but basically the person is trying to shoot is doing the same thing, but the projectile is gonna go in your direction. So I don't stay uh, behind someone who's shooting, let's say if they're shooting in that direction, don't stay behind because you're automatically in the corner of fire. And you don't want to be fi a five meter left or right from that individual because automatically when they, they aim at him, but the projectile go five meter left, five meter right. What you want to do, you don't want to be behind, you want to be at basically if it's the street, you want to be where they're like the building or the wall over here, sometimes they have like a door you want to be away. You want to be away from the corner fire. Like basically in the street, it will be, let's say the street, the car, the sidewalk. You want to be near the wall where they have the building, maybe inside like a certain entrance there, like in the picture over here, right? But although don't stay in the corner fire because you more likely to receive a, a projectile. Um, what so far we know, right, that they have used, right, last Wednesday and what they're going to most likely to see. I do not know, I don't think we're going to have a Oklahoma, Oklahoma bombing 2.0. No, it just, it's just too complex. You know, the FBI, they will know right away, okay? Um, what they more likely to use, pipe bomb, which is, uh, it's like, like the, the thing here, it's really easy to do, like a kid could actually doing it. It's a pipe, they put explosive, they close the pipe, they're just gonna, you, you know, and then they're gonna just throw the thing, you're right. Uh, and if you see that on the floor, stay away. It's about, it's the, the, the radius, the little, a radius is about five meters. That's why you want to stay away from that. Cocktail Molotov, right? So I was saying don't wear uh, nylon polyester, right? Because it melts, okay? Um, but basically that, if you see anyone with that, like in a crowd, stay away because if it go off, right? But basically, if you receive any liquid, you will burn. Okay, and then it's not gonna stop. Okay, they use oil, you know, put fuel in it, and they just throw it up. Okay, do so if you see someone that stay away. Okay, uh, I mean assault weapon, right? Long long rifle weapon. Uh, if you see anyone with a gun, like I'm not speaking about DC because DC, you know, they're not even supposed to have a gun. But in other states, that's it's open carry. As soon as you see a person with a gun, right, and if, you know, try to avoid that place, if they all have guns, I mean, it's, you know, it's another dynamic, but try to avoid to have any interaction with someone with guns, like at least, you know, visible guns. In terms of, in terms of bomb threats, right, bomb threats, it's, um, um, right, the, I, like I said, I don't think they're going to, the, the, the threat is going to be a big, big bomb, like in a big explosive, right? But if they manage to have a bomb and then basically the police say, oh, we may have some a car with a bomb in it or something. As soon as you hear bomb, stay away from windows because you're more likely, because like in, uh, in Lebanon, like in the Lebanon uh, bombing, it was a good example is like the, the first wave went up to one mile, right? So I, if you're near a windows, right? If you're near uh, a car, you have to stay at least minimum five meters from a window, right? Or any glass. Why? Because if the bomb go off, right? You could be at 500 meters. And then if you near like, let's say a glass door near a windows, all the windows are gonna be like shrapnels, the, the glasses from the windows from the car, and then will basically hit you like shrapnels. Okay, you have to stay at least at five meters. Okay, and then um, try to find a hardcore, but stay away from windows or any glass. Okay, if let's say okay, well we're, we're thinking there's a bomb or something like that. Of course, if you don't know, you don't know, but uh, that's crazy. Okay, 
in term, there's any question uh, on that? No, we're good, yeah. Um, awesome, active shooter, okay? So I, what we saw is basically all the right uh, militia groups, extra organized, but all the time you could have, let's say someone from QAnon is saying like, you know, I'm, I'm gonna save the planet and then it's gonna start shooting on anymore, right? But basically that's an, uh, that's some uh, something actually could happen, right? Um, right, um, during a protest, okay? Um, there's basically two scenario basically more likely to happen, right? It's active shooter using high ground firing down from a high rise building could be a possibility. Let's say during a march in DC organized by BLM after a inauguration, okay? And then you have someone who basically know he's gonna go on the third floor, it's gonna start showing the crowd. Okay, that's one possibility. Another possibility, right, could be during a march or a peaceful demonstration or, or multiple individual, two or three, could target minorities, journalists, or any person serving the outcome of the election. Okay, but basically the goal is um, what the, the most important that they could actually do, you know, uh, it's a big concern is will be that someone will shoot in the direction of the crowd, hide or drop his gun, get in the crowd and shoot again. Who can be have it? Because in the crowd, if let's say someone shoot two, three person, hide the gun and go in the crowd, right? Uh, you will not see the person. The person will go there and then shoot again and after moving around and moving around. That's why I stay away from the crowd. Another possible scenario could be that one individual were more concerning weapon in, in their back, like I was just saying. So I assume there's any shooter situation, stay away from the crowd, try to get a vantage point in a higher ground or leave the zone immediately. But you have to leave the crowd, okay? Going back to your secure point. Um, when moving, try to stay on the edge of the crowd, like I was saying earlier, sidewalk, right? If it's a march along the sidewalk. Um, if a shooting occurs, it's the safest place. Always have a safe route or possible cover. So I basically, if I think basically that it could be a, it could happen, but I want to have my admin point or in my security point, I want to have some place like a cover, right? If something happened, okay, that's a, like, they're like big block, maybe a big tree, maybe a car, right? You need to taking that in consideration. Active shooter targets area where a large uh, crowd gather. It's what they want to see because it's easy. You know, they don't even have to shoot. An active shooter, when they shoot it in a crowd, they, they they aim and usually when the person they aim, it's not even the person who received the bullet. It's anyone. They can just pray, right? So why they they can shoot the, the person that were they aiming is more less likely to be the person they're gonna receive the bullet because they're all all together, all crowded, right? So I avoiding the middle of the crowd because it's hard to flee uh, to get um, you know or to get covered during a massive shooting. So in the middle of the crowd, you're always more vulnerable because you. You know, that's going to be like a stand B situation. You don't want that. You always want to be an extremity to be able to leave the crowd. Um, if you're shooting um, occur uh, and you cannot move, maybe you want to lay down, right? And then observe what's happening and after go, you want to be as low as you possible if you hear gunshot. Uh, why? Because you don't want to have a full silhouette if you put your knee down, but at least you're less, you, even though less likely to receive a, a bullet or less than if you're standing up. Don't stay in the kill zone as soon as you can move, right? And then basically it's always speed and distance, you know, if in case of active shooter, okay? Um, yeah, active shooter, they really choose their, their victim randomly, right? You know, they, they look for easy target. If you're in a crowd, it's easier. The harder you are to shoot when you're gonna run, right? It's always speed and distance. You want to run as fast as you can from the threat. Um, so if you, let's say, Let's say you're, you're in an active shooting situation and you see the shooter, there is no way, right? You start shooting. Maybe you want to consider laying down and work in the past, playing dead for a short period of times, right? Until they, you, you're actually out of the sight of the attackers. But you have to take in mind that as soon as he left, don't stay there too long because in order situation, the shooter came back and then just start shooting at any individual. But that was more like in indoor venues, not outside. Right outside, or like to just go into another place. But if it's inside and then you have nowhere to go, let's say coffee shop or restaurant, you want to uh, basically put a floor 
and then you know play that until it is out of sight right with and then leave as soon as uh, possible okay uh, in terms of security forces tactics right it's really really basically the same they're doing for years okay it's because it's working okay uh, of course there's a lot of like new weapon they're using now but which is we're going to see but it's always two things right containment right it's it's base and line and bars right local police special police units you know with the shields and the bot button right and national guards national are more likely to be these kind of line okay um so I, that's containment which is they're passive they just stay there you know they don't move until they receive the order to pass from containment to dispersal which is they're gonna um there's any question because i see the number eight maria alejandra there's no question right in the chat oh no i'm sorry we just got one um so there was a question about working with a partner and watching their back. Are you usually communicating verbally in the middle of the action, telling them when you need to pull back or go, or do you physically maneuver them? Um, asking because it seems like it would be difficult to hear each other or risky to communicate your next move out loud. Sure. Uh, in terms of, uh, of it's, it's, we, we need to, uh, and then jump in right after Karin, but basically in terms of like, Let's say um, like I'm in danger or I, uh, I really need to getting out, right? And then everyone is yelling, right? You Sometimes you don't have to explain or you could, what, what I call like a password, right? You can, that can be one words that that person knows that you need to go to the administrative point, right? Or it can be a sign, right? Uh, you know, really, really easy to like thumbs, thumbs down or something. And then that's, and then you have to speak with your partner saying it's time to go to the anniversary point because maybe, you know, they're grinning going on, they're like flashback, right? And then there's no way you can actually communicate. So I could go with basically one password, to be honest, like work with a lot of um, journalists and everywhere, Latin American stuff. And then there's, you know, always um, there's a password, you know, that I use the same one. It's really easy. My password when I was working with them with that we need to go. Right, it's that was Obama, right? Because it was easier. Obama, right? Okay, we can, we have to go, right? Because it's not a sign. Look, uh, have someone, someone who got like he's been following me, and then you know you don't have time to that to to explain explain the person that you need to go. Maybe you saw something. Maybe you saw a weapon, and then everyone is yelling. You your eardrum is like, you know, I have some some problem, right? So it's not the time. So I a, a password or a password with a sign could actually uh, do the job. And then, yeah, do you want to continue for the for the rest, Karen? Yeah, sure. So I actually ran into this because um, I, I didn't think of this until it happened to me. But when we were covering the, the, um, the car that drove into the crowd and the driver got out and shot, um, at that time, there was a lot of tear gas in the air and I was wearing this. And if if this is sealed properly, you can't hear the person talking. It's it's not designed. There's no valve for speaking. And so I was wearing this and I, I yelled gun, gun, and none of the other journalists there heard me. So <laughs> that's not a good situation. I mean, if you, if you, I mean, at that point, I, I was just like, I pulled it off and yelled, but, but yeah, I think it's, it's a really good point. You, even if you're not wearing the mask, you might not be able to hear your partner. You might not even be able to hear the people around you. So that's why it's really important to know who you're working with before you get there, uh, establishing either a safe word or a gesture um, if you really think it's going to be really loud. So, so for me, it's like, we're, go we're out, pull back. Um, and just making sure you're working with someone you really trust. Um, because I, I've worked with people before who I know, even if I did that, they would be like, oh, but it's happening. I want to photograph this. And that's not a good situation to be in. You have to be like, no, like if as soon as one of us is not feeling safe, we, we will stop. So that's what I would recommend. That's good. And, and you know, a good sign, you know, that it's clear. It could be an X, right? Or something you're going to see me. Boom. There's, you know, some sort of gesture you could do. That is closer and clearer, but like like Karen was saying, you need to speak with, with the person and then you are on the same level as me, right? That you're not trying, you know, the, to get yourself killed. Okay. Um good in terms of like so I say containment, right? It's you know, as soon as they got an order, they're gonna go to dispersal and then they're gonna use tear gas, paper, which is gonna see the weapon right away, 
flashbang, rubble balls, sting balls, which you're going to see. They could use bicycle brigades. Bicycle brigades, to be honest, like, you know, they, they look like nothing, but it's actually working really well. They can actually disperse really well. They're going to throw grenade, they're going to throw a flashback, and they're going to disperse a crowd. They, and they can use the basically the, 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 the bike to attack, right? Uh, to disperse, so they're going to jump, and then, you know, like, you receive literally a bike on your face and then you know and then they're all doing that together so I, it is really uh you know uh, it's yeah it's really aggressive uh or they can use a vehicle okay um there's a third element which is the arrest and detention there's a team we call this snatching teams and the only thing they do they look they look someone taking picture they look someone with a loud mic and they're gonna just run and hit the person and then drag the person uh, to uh, basically to the inside of the security perimeter, which is their first one. So are they gonna maybe throw a grenade and then they're a flashbang and they're gonna run, smashing the person, dragging the person by the foot all the way inside the inside the corridor. Um, and then confiscation of equipment, camera, detention. To be honest, like they, um, like the police, they really don't care like, you know, if you're a journalist or not, the, the, the only thing they, they have to, to do, it's disperse, the, doing, the, uh, disperse, right? And detain. They, if you say you're a journalist, they will deal with you most likely afterwards, right? They really, 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 really don't care, right? Um, and as well, there's also the effect of like chaos and, to, and television, but they're most likely to not caring if you say you're a journalist or you're raising your hand or something. They will detain you, okay? They really don't care. Uh, all right, riot control agents, uh, basically, which is we call like tear gas. Uh, there's tear gas, it's like CS, CN, um, okay, uh, which is the term. When they say, like, let's say the police uh, or the mayor saying, okay, we're not using any tear gas, what they do is they replace it by OC, OC, it is paper spray. Right, they say we're not using tear gas, but in they're just changing weapons and they're using OC. OC is basically uh, the paper spray, which is the same thing than tear gas. Tear gas, it's all chemical, and paper spray, it just uh, it's like sort of natural. But you know, but they 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 actually develop uh, quite a couple of weapons to using OC. But let's say like the federal police or the army, they use tear gas, even if they say they're not using tear gas. Um, right, one uh, of the new uh, weapon they're using and they're overusing, it's a rubber ball or also called a sting ball. And it basically what it is, it's, um, they, it's a grenade device and that's going to be light, sound, and OC. It, that, that's going to actually, when it explodes, it's going to release small rubber balls, right? And then what's going to do is going to hit you and then that's going to explode and there's going to be OC, it's going to be pepper spray. So if you're near a grenade, a big boom, a big flash, like a flashbang, and then you're gonna receive uh, like small like rubber bullets, and that will basically kick off, and then you're gonna fill all the smoke, and it's basically a, a, a paper spray, okay? And then basically it's psycholo psy psychological, physical, and then um, and then light and sound. It is as soon as you that's the brain over here, you're really freaking out. There's no way you. You cannot keep your calm. It is really like uh, freaking out. And you're going to feel, if it's near you, you're going to feel that you have a burning sensation, right? It's all the psychological effect of it, okay? But there, there's like, you're not supposed to have any burn. It's the burning sensation um, affecting skin area too that you freaked out, okay? Another uh, one, paper spray, which is the first line or any police officer have that. And then basically it's OC paper spray and it goes to three to five meters, right? To be honest, like pepper spray, like you have pepper spray in tear gas as well. It, tear gas is just a mix of everything, right? It's a bit more str strong, but pepper spray, but basically it's a spray and then gas, uh, tear gas, it's basically uh, a, a, like a smoke, okay? So it's three to five meters, okay? So stay away from anyone with the line because they can use it, okay? Uh, flash by grenade, okay? It's, you know, big boom, big flash, right? 180 decibels. It's extremely, extremely, extremely 
are loud, right? Um, and then it can cause uh, disorientation, confusion. You're really confused, you're scared and stuff, and you're freaking out. Okay, that they you overuse a lot to disperse the crowd. The same with the grenade. The grenade is a bit more effective because they have the, the gas on it. Um, uh, uh, what they're gonna, the tear gas, they're gonna use this weapon to actually using it, okay? It's a 40 millimeter, um, or they can use the one on the bottom, right? It's a grenade launcher. And what they're gonna use is this weapon to actually shoot, uh, shoot this weapon um, to, sorry, that was the wrong slide. Yeah, oops, sorry. Um, yeah, sorry. Uh, yeah, basically they're gonna use this weapon, right? Or the, the big riot gun over here to basically be able to shoot uh, tear gas, okay? And that is basically the radius of the smoke. It's 10 by 10 meters. So if you see a big uh, white uh, smoke, it's 10 meters to 10 meters. And that's gonna stay there on at least until 30 seconds. And after that's gonna move with actually the, the wind. They can actually hit until 75 meters. They should incline the guns. And then they're using the same gun to basically uh, shoot with these, um, basically, they call it a less little foam projectile. You know, everyone call it rubber bullet. They actually stopped using rubber, rubber bullet because they figured that they killed too many persons with rubber bullet. What they use, it's they're using these less little foam projectile. Okay. It's extremely painful, right? You, you know, you could die, you know, if they shoot you within 10 meters in the, on, on, on face. Uh, the uh, effective range is 50 meters, right? Uh, and then they call it spo sponge uh, round foam rubber ball. It is extremely, extremely painful. It can it cause you severe injuries, right? And then um, you can see on the pictures over here, okay? Um, so I'm using the same gun for this uh, projectile, right? Uh, and then the smoke. Or they can just use the, the grenade, CS grenade, okay, tear gas, okay? And then, you know, 25 meters will be the, the range, but it's the same radius, 10 meters by 10 meters, okay? And then they're gonna overuse these kind of uh, stuff. Well, the weapon they, now they use the most, it's actually paper balls from OC when they said like, oh, we're not using tear gas anymore, but they're using pepper spray. Basically it's a, it's a paintball gun and they fill out or modify paintball gun. And what they do is they fill out with, uh, with uh, pr uh, paper ball, paper spray projectile. It, they hit you first, the, the rubber, let's say the, the, the paintball projectile will explode and then you're gonna, you're gonna, they're gonna go straight to your lung and that's gonna be pepper spray. Okay, so if you see someone with that, stay away. Okay, and basically it's, no more than 50 meters, it's more like 25 meters, okay? Because it's a pain. Well, 25, 30 meters, uh, you know, there's gonna be basically the, the effective range for this kind of weapon. They can shoot you a lot of weapon of, of, of time because there are a lot of projectile, like, like a pinball gun. Here it's more like local, uh, local if you see it, a, a shotgun like that or a orange, orange, like orange uh, shotgun, is because they're using bean bag. Bean bag, uh, it's, uh, it's a, it's basically like the other projectile I was showing you. It's extremely painful, right? And it ranges 25 meters. Uh, and it's like, yeah, it can br br break you a, a, a rib. It's extremely, extremely uh, painful, okay? That in terms of basically to disperse the crowd. If you're exposed to tear gas, do not wear contact lenses, okay? Wear glasses. Maybe if you have glasses in no PP, maybe you should maybe put an elastic band, right? You don't want to lose your glasses. If you're running, cosmetic can be uh, irritants, right? In the contact of, of, of the tear gas, the same with contact lenses. That's why you could actually burn your routine. So I do not wear at all uh, contact lenses, wear glasses, okay? If exposed, do not have PPE. Try to get, like I was saying earlier, a higher ground because gases are actually heavier than air, okay? Um, once home, clean your clothes. If you, you know, you need to clean your, all your clothing, everything, because it's all in contact. On the worst stop, in the laundry machine, but at cold, cold water. Why? If you bring hot water, it's gonna always come back. You will never get rid of the gas. Okay, up to 10 days, okay? That's why you need to wash it with cold water. If you hit the shower, uh, you need to use cold uh, water or like not make tempered water, not hot, because if you're using hot, the hot water will actually open your pore, right? And then the gas will come back, okay? So cold, it's good for your skin anyways. 
Um, Sound Cannon, right? Sound Cannon is, um, uh, is a cannon they're using uh, and they're probably gonna use it everywhere. It's a, it's a long range acoustic device uh, and it's gonna emit until 150 decibel. And it, as soon as they deploy it, it's a, usually it's a truck with a big, big like speaker sort on the top or it's more, you know, it's more like uh, rectangular, right? And they, they're gonna, as soon as they shoot, but it's a sound cannon, there's no way you can stay. They, they force you to just getting out because you cannot even hear anything. And it's, uh, after a while, it's really painful. They're, they're, they have the same thing in on motorcycle as well, a small one to basically disperse. You can actually carry a earplug with you, right? Or if you want to be like Korean, you can actually have a pair of shooting air muff and your stuff, uh, because if they're using a lot, you want to have that. A good thing about the pair of shooting era is it will blot. Uh, you're gonna be able to speak with everyone, right? But it's gonna block all the decibel until like 90, right? Which is a uh, air plug, uh, it's until a certain limit and you won't basically hear anything around you. Um, okay, in terms of, um, basically, um, in terms of gas, uh, the Yes. I just want to stop um, because I know that we are like at the end of our time. So we, um, maybe we could take uh, questions so that the I have, I have one more, uh, more slide. That's it. Oh, okay. Sorry. I thought you were going into the PP. No, no, no. no. Uh, in terms of um, no, no, no. Basically, in terms of um, of uh, of when you I mean in contact with gas, uh, basically dust mask or any scarf or anything like that will not work against any gas. It will never work. Okay. What could work? It's actually N95 or the approved and KN95 without valve will actually work because it's actually a filter 95 person. It's going to work until a certain extent, um, right? Um, against uh, tear gas, okay, particle, okay? Uh, but the normal mask will actually not protect. There is something you can buy on Amazon right before we end it, and it's called the RZ mask. Uh, I actually tested myself with paper spray. It worked really well because it does stop 99.9% of, um, of any particle, including gas. So I worked really well uh, with that. Okay. On that, I will let it to Maria Alejandra. Sorry, Jeff, didn't mean to cut you off. Um, yeah, I know that we're over time. Um, so I wanted to give everyone the chance to ask questions if they have questions. Um, and we'll stick around in case anyone has like any very like specific questions about what to buy or um, what to take. Um, and we'll also share this Jeff's slides, which um, if he had kept going, like there's links and more explanations of the type of PPE to get. Um, but we'll share that with you with the link so that in case you're interested in buying any of that, um, you can go ahead and look at it. Um, and then we will also share the recording of this webinar in case you want to refer back to it. Um, and my colleague, Jen, actually shared a couple of resources. Um, if you need uh, financial assistance to cover, to cover PPE, medical aid, uh, destroyed or stolen equipment, um, please apply to the IWMS US Emergency Fund. Um, we also have the Black Journalist Therapist Therapy Relief Fund, uh, and she posted the links to that in the chat. Um, she also said to save RCFP's hotline number um, in case you need a lawyer when you're in the field, and that's in the chat as well. Um, so that being said, thank you so much for being with us and uh, for being on this webinar. Um, I know that it was a lot of information um, and there's a lot to think about, um, but again, like I said, um, feel free to dip out if, um, if you need to. Uh, we'll stick around in case anybody has additional questions.